So in honor of the Jake Paul Mike Tyson fight coming up, I thought I'd break down the biomechanics and the anatomy of the differences between their hooks and a couple of reasons why this will very likely lead to Jake Paul's demise, provided it's not rigged, of course. We'll start with what I find to be the most notable difference biomechanically, and that's how well Mike Tyson uses his ability to produce force through his trunk versus how poorly Jake Paul seems to do this. All right, so now we're gonna look at the Human Anatomy Atlas app, and it's gonna show us some of the muscles that are bigger and therefore able to produce a lot more force than some of the smaller muscles at the arm. Okay, so we'll start here at the back. Look how robust this muscle is, it's called the multifidus. It actually runs along the entire length of the spine, but again, it's the most robust here at the lumbar spine. And then we'll come over to the internal oblique uh, involved in rotation and the external oblique involved in rotation as well. Look how big these muscles are. It's no surprise that if we just kind of back up and look at the global movement that it's able to produce, the ability to generate force from the central part of our body to the outer part of our body or the periphery is integral to the ability to be able to produce a lot of force whenever you strike. Now let's see how each of them use their trunk when it comes to throwing a hook. When we see Mike Tyson fight or do pad work, we see that his arm is mainly just going along for the ride. Sometimes depending on the situation, he follows through or extends a little more, but for the most part, there's a lot of movement through his trunk, which generates all that power that we know him for. Jake Paul, on the other hand, seems to be an overextending machine. And I'm not just talking about leading with the head either. I'm talking about not rotating at the trunk and using almost arm or extremity muscles. Notice how much further his arm travels using the shoulder as the fulcrum of his movement, rather than using the trunk as a fulcrum. In general, the more that we can distribute force through the hip and the trunk, the more power we can expect in almost any athletic situation. So, advantage Mike. And this leads nicely into the next part of the breakdown, where we look at the muscles of the shoulder and the arm that are involved with the hook. Jake has a pretty solid physique, good sized chest and arms, so you can obviously tell that he lifts and he has some strength. Mike Tyson, even at 58, is still a little bit bigger. Now, I think we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that age plays a huge role here. But with a genetic specimen like Mike, I think it plays a little less of a role when it comes to muscle mass. Okay, so back to the Human Anatomy Atlas app, and here we're gonna look at the muscles of the front of the shoulder that are involved with throwing the hook that are, we're gonna separate them from those big muscles of the trunk that we looked at earlier. The first one here is pec major. Uh, under that is pec minor, and it's kind of contributing to this, but the main uh, primary mover of this motion uh, in isolation is the pec minor, or excuse me, the pec major. Uh, and then the anterior delt, uh, the, the belly of the delt that is the most forward in the body. Okay, so those are the two muscles that are involved in this. And another thing I want you to look at is just how small they are uh, in comparison to the muscles of the trunk. Right? So if we only rely, or we mainly rely on these to throw the punch, we know that we're not gonna be able to generate as much force as we would if we coordinate that movement uh, in a productive way uh, whenever we're trying to deliver force through our hand and our upper body when we're striking with a hook. And the last advantage for Tyson has everything to do with not getting knocked out. And that's made possible, first and foremost, by the neck. I talk at length about the physiology of a knockout in one of my previous videos. And just how important a strong neck is to resisting the quick rotational force that seems to be associated with knockout shots to the head. In other words, big muscular necks and their ability to resist rotational force decrease the likelihood of getting knocked out. All right, and back to the Human Anatomy Atlas app. One last time for this video, you'll see that they're doing left rotation here, okay? So these muscles that I'm about to show you are producing a movement that moves away from the side of the muscles that are on, okay? So the first one here is the sternocleidomastoid. It's the really big muscle that everybody knows when it kind of pops out in the front of the neck. That's one muscle. Another one is the motifidus, again, one that we saw in the lumbar spine, a little less robust uh, in the upper, in the thoracic part of the spine, in the cervical part of the spine. And then we have semispinalis cervicis, which is just another kind of secondary muscle that helps with contralateral rotation. And now we have rotation going towards the side of the muscle, okay? So as we spin around here, we can see that all the way up here, and this is just a good example. A lot of people think that the upper trap is the, is the big muscle of the neck. When you take the upper trap off of the neck, these are, this is all the small little muscles that are involved in uh, neck rotation and really neck stability in general. Okay, so we have the splenius capitis here, which is, I have found to be some of the most um, contributing muscle when it comes to neck pain. We also have the splenius cervices and then the longissimus thoracis. Okay, so just layers upon layers of you know, th uh, cervicothoracic musculature that play a huge role in the ability to withstand a rotational force or resist that rotational force uh, when you take a shot to the head.
Now, look at this fucking neck right here. Good God, bro. Mike Tyson has a thick ass neck. Anyway, let's compare him now. Jake Paul's doing himself a favor with the beard. Kind of gives the impression that his neck is a little bit bigger than it is. And I'm trying to be as charitable as possible here, but his neck just isn't very well developed if you look at his most recent pictures. Tyson has certainly lost some size in his neck. However, it's still developed from all that training and taking all those shots in the past. So his ability to resist the quick rotation of a neck that's associated with knockouts will likely be better than Jake's. Even on the off chance that Jake is able to string together any meaningful for combos. So, full advantage Tyson again. But there is one thing we're forgetting that probably plays a bigger role than we'd like to admit. And this is that Jake Paul's clout chasing abilities are unmatched. This makes the situation unbelievably susceptible to bribing or other nefarious acts. Although I will say that two minute rounds, KO only finish, and it being sanctioned as a pro fight all seem to favor Tyson. So I'll give another half advantage to Jake. In all seriousness, I have no ill will towards Jake Paul. Quite honestly, I think he gets a lot of unwarranted hate because of how he chooses to live his life. And just because that's not how I would set up my life doesn't mean I need to shit on his. I wish him nothing but success. I just don't think he'll win this fight against Tyson, especially if there's no funny business behind the scenes. Give me your predictions down below in the comments. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.